going through the end of year 10 exam. Uh, this is paper one. Uh, the first question was estimate the value of 43.3 times 49.8 all divided by 200. When you want to estimate, make sure you round these to one significant figure. It'll make your calculations a lot easier because although we could round this correctly to 43, it's going to be even easier if we round it to 40. So the first line of my working, I changed these values to 40, 50 and kept that at 200. 4 times 5 gave 20. Irrelevant that that answer comes out in a 0. You then add these two zeros on the end there. Okay, so then we get 2,000 divided by 200. Any constant zeros at the top and bottom, we can cancel. So a zero there and there goes, zero there and there goes, leaving us 20 divided by 2, which is 10. The next question uh, was an estimating one as well. Now, one significant figure means you round after the first non-zero number. So that's why the line has gone down after the 9 and the 4 this time. That 6 is going to round that 9 to 1.0 or just 1. And that is going to become 0.5. So the question here is 1 divided by 0.5. Now, a lot of the mistakes in the exam, people just leaving it as that. It was only worth one mark. You will not get the mark for just rounding them. You've got to say how many 0.5s go into 1. So count in 0.5s. 0.5, 1. So the answer was 2. The next one was using known facts to derive unknowns. If you count here... There's three decimal places after the decimal point. There's uh, one, two, three, and here just one. Three and one gives a total of four decimal places. So this answer has to have four decimal places. You'll notice here that number is still that number. It's just got a decimal place with four numbers after the decimal point. Whenever you're dividing, the opposite happens. If you're dividing and we're making a number smaller, then your answer is actually going to get bigger. So this one here gets smaller by two places from this this thing rearranged by dividing so because it's got smaller by two places this needs to get bigger by two places or two decimal places i.e. that's been divided by 100 this needs to be times by 100 so we've added two zeros on there and then this one here caused a lot of headaches what is one half of three and a half split your components up like you've been taught since year seven you've got three and a half what's half of three 1.5, what's half of 0.5? 0.25. Put those two things back together and you get 1.75. Question 2 gave a scatter graph with these values here that you had to plot. The most important thing you do with any, any graph question that they've given you a scale is you go and work out what the scale is. So the first thing I did by here was go and work out what the jump up was from here. So 200 to 250 is a jump of 50. I then divided by 10 because there are 10 little squares that go up until the 250. That step there is absolutely essential. That tells me that's 5. So one tiny little square here is worth 5. I could have done exactly the same here by doing 200 because that is a jump of 200 divided by 10 again because there's 10 little squares. So each little square is worth 20 however you weren't given any nasty numbers so I didn't feel the need to do that one so plotting these points here to get the two marks you had to plot them all correctly to get one of those two marks you had to plot at least three correctly the next question you were asked was what is the type of correlation so you've got three types of correlation positive negative or no correlation uh, if they're going in a diagonal line either from bottom left to top right or from top left to bottom right that is going to be there's a correlation either positive or negative in this case it's going from bottom left to top right that tells me that I'm going in a positive correlation if it had been going this way it would have been negative uh, by eye draw the line of best fit now when it says by eye that just means draw what you can see if it did not say draw by eye and it is worth two marks you'd have to go and find the mean value so you'd add up all of these points here and divide by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So you add all those up and divide by 7. Add all these up and divide by 7. You'd have to plot that point and your line of best fit, this guy, would have to go through the mean point which you would have plotted and circled. However, this was a non-calculated paper. That's unlikely to come up in a non-calculated paper. That is much more likely to come up in a calculated paper. Um, it then says estimate... The amount of money that um, that may have been taken by ice cream sellers during one day that had 6,100 people attended the festival on that day. So you come to your graph here, you look 
for 6,100, so that's clearly going to be exactly in between 6,000 and 6,200. You draw up to your line of best fit, and then you come across and read off the value. For me, that was £375. However, you do not have to have 375 to get the answer is no matter what your line of best fit tells, as long as it's obvious that you've gone and worked that out properly. Finally, part E, lots of people didn't get this. Uh, a little bit of a sneaky one, I thought. It said, explain why it is not possible to work out how much a typical ice cream costs by the festivals. Uh, I've, I've tried to make two points. I've said that the ice creams have different prices. We're only told how much the sellers take based on a number of people. We don't know how many people actually bought ice cream. So how on earth can we tell how much one ice cream sells? Question three created a headache for more or less everyone who I taught in year 10. So it says that Lorna has begun by drawing two quadrilaterals. So you need to be able to recall loads and loads and loads of different quadrilaterals. You should know a trapezium. You should be able to know a rhombus, a parallelogram, a diamond, a kite. And you should know all the properties from that. That is stuff that you won't have been taught in year 10 necessarily. We might be looking at you recalling knowledge from years 8, 9 as well. Um, we're told here, the key word, is that she's drawn the diagonal. So lots of the mo uh, misconceptions in this was people used the line that was already drawn to try and draw the shape that they said, and that, that's wrong. It's the diagonal of that that was already drawn. So actually no size of the shape at all. Uh, she then gives clues to help you draw the quadrilaterals. Uh, completing the drawings, write down the corners of the vertices. Vertices is just a posh word for corners of the quadrilateral. Okay, so the first one says... My shape is a kite. One of the diagonals is shown. One of the vertices of the kite is at minus 5, 4. Now, the number of people who plotted this point wrong or they read off their coordinates wrong was a little bit worrying for year 10. You need to make sure that you can be able to plot coordinates correctly. It's given in alphabetical order. Your coordinates will be x, y. So this minus 5 is x and this y is, is um, 4. So I need to go across to minus 5, so that's minus 5 here, then up to 4. Okay, we can't be getting that wrong in year 10. Um, so I plotted that and I've said that point is given. I knew that was a diagonal. So what I did was I joined this up to here and joined this up to here. And I can start to sort of see that my kite is drawn here. Now the point that I've made over here is for a kite, it's going to look something like this, the thing you fly in the sky. This diagonal is a line of symmetry, which you can probably see I've written by there. These lengths here are exactly the same and these lengths here are exactly the same okay so coming back to my drawing here I knew that if I had that as a line of four then as that was a line of symmetry that this must be four down here at this point here so I drew that point joined it up and sure enough hopefully that looks just like a kite then I needed to read off the coordinates and this was the the point I was alluding to earlier this is where people were going wrong the number of people that said that was minus 5 minus 2 was worrying it's not it's minus 7 minus 2 this point here is minus 1 0 and then everyone should have been able to get at least one mark on this question because these ones were given all you had to do is read off these two coordinates then again this question here it said my shape is a rhombus. The shorter diagonal is shown. The other diagonal is twice as long as the one I've already drawn. Okay. Now, I was worried that a number of people didn't even know what a rhombus is. A rhombus is just a pushed over square. So I've got my drawing here. It's a pushed over square. So all the sides, these dashes mean all the sides are the same. And the diagonals will always intersect at 90 degrees. Okay, so there's my right angle there. Now, if this line here, zoom in, is already drawn, and I know that goes cross one up two, then this line here had to be twice as long. So I knew this side had to go down one across one, down one across, sorry, down one across two, down one across two to get to there, and I had to do it the other way to make it twice as long, because this part of blue line here is the same length as that black line there. And you can see, hopefully, that my... Uh, diagonals intersect at 90 degrees so then once I've plotted those two points then I just join them up to make a rhombus and if I measured those lines there they should measure exactly the same in my ruler again one mark should have been easier I should have just been reading off these coordinates here here and here so that's 2 1 and 4 5 the other one I needed was minus 1 5 and 7 1 which are these answers given by here 
Okay, question four tells us the area of the trapezium is equal to the area of the right angle triangle. Now, the key thing about this is that formula for a trapezium is given in the exam. So it's this formula here. So you don't need to know it, you just need to know how to use it. A plus B are the parallel sides. So these arrows here tell me the parallel sides. So in this case, the top and bottom, but not necessarily. They could be either side if that was rotated round by 90 degrees. Okay? Um, so I have substituted into that. So if I come here to hide my other answer, I get a half of the top plus the bottom, or the parallel sides, which is uh, through bib mass, do the brackets first, is 16. Half of 16 is 8. 8 times by 5 is 40 centimetres squared. Now, the key thing here was that we were told that this area is equal to the area of the right angle triangle. So what I had to do on the other side here was use the formula for area of a triangle, which is base times by height divided by 2, or a half base times height, either way around. So that 40 from that answer is the same 40 here because they are the same area. They are equal in area. So subbing into that, the base of that triangle is x. That's what they've called it. The height is 10. Uh, so x times 10 divided by 2, I could write that as 10x if I wanted to, or just x times by 10 is fine. I've taken my divide by 2 round to the other side to get times by 2, so that's become 80. Uh, and then, I've not done anything to this side, I've just kept that as x times 10. I've taken the times by 10 over to become divide by 10, and get my answer as 8 is equal to x. Question 5 was on pie charts. Okay, so what we had to do is we had to look at the angle that we were given uh, given us here, although I am diving straight into the question. It says there are more pupils in class B than in class A. That, that would suggest why these pie charts are different sizes. If they were the same size, it might be a bit misleading. We're told that there are four boys in class A, that there are one and a half times as many girls in class B than in class A. How many boys are in class B? So, what we need to do here is because we know there are four boys here. That is clearly one quarter. If I was unsure, I could have measured the angle, found it to be 90 degrees out of 360, and then cancelled that down to being one quarter. So if one quarter is four, then this is three times as much. This is three quarters. So four times three gives me the 12. I'm then told here that there are one and a half times as many girls in this class here. So I need to do 12 multiplied by one and a half. So there's a couple of ways I can do that. If I do 12 times 1, it's a little bit too big. Try again. If I do 12 times 1, I get 12. If I do uh, 12 times 2, I get 24. So 12 times 1 and a half must be in the middle of these two numbers here. So that's how I got the 18. Another way of doing it, when you times them by 1 and a half, is to find half of 12, which is 6, and just add it on to 1 times 12. So you also get 1 and a half. Um, finally, I had to go and work out what fraction that is. Now, some people can spot this. I just can spot it as one-third. Um, how else I could have done it is I could have actually measured the angle to find it was 120 degrees and cancelled down, like we said before, so 120 out of 360, and then cancel that down to being one-third. If that's one-third, if this piece here is one-third, then this is two-thirds. So if that's two-thirds, then what I need to do is just divide it by two, to find out that there are nine boys in that class. So if we look at my workings here, I've said a quarter is equal to four. Um, so the boys is equal to four, so the girls three quarters must be one quarter times by three, which is 12. There I've done my 12 times one and a half to get 18 by here, and I've stated that that is two thirds. So two thirds is equal to 18, so one third must be half of that, which is the answer, nine altogether. Question six on the algebra was done really, really well. A uh, few common mistakes made that we see all the time. Just be careful that you don't make these. You always want to start by choosing the smallest of the two x's. So 6x or 4x. So 4x is smaller. So I'm taking 4x over. Now, not just the 4, the entire thing, 4x. So I'm moving it over to this side. So the sign that's changing is the positive that is in front of the 4 that's not written when you start a sentence. So that will become minus 4x. And this minus 27 is coming over, and that will become positive 27. Do not forget that this is minus 13. That was the main issue I saw here. So, getting that onto the other side here, I got that 4x changing to the minus 4x, that 27 changing to a positive 27, and then just solve as follows. So 2x equals 14, so x equals 7. The next one here... A number of people took this divide by 2 over 2 early and times by 2. 
it's still exactly the same sort of idea as the ones above. You do anything that's not physically attached to the x first. That's what goes. So that positive 18 goes over and becomes minus 18. And then that divide by 2 goes over and becomes a times by 2. Next one, factorise means put back into brackets. So the common thing that's in both of these, y squared minus 5y. Well, the thing I said twice then was y. So I pull out a factor of y. Um, I always pull out the factor with the lowest power of y. So this hasn't got a power. It has really the power is 1. So it's the y that comes out. And I divide both of these terms by y. So y squared divided by y would be y. And 5y divided by y would just be 5. So then if I expanded this bracket, I get y squared minus 5y, again, to get back to that expression here. And then this one here, y times y squared. Again, we said before, if that hasn't got a number written there, it has got a power. It's 1 when you're multiplying powers. Powers add together. So y times by y squared is y cubed plus 4y to get that bit there. Uh, and then the inequality, a couple of people miss this, is exactly the same as solving an equation. You just have to put that inequality sign there the entire time and do not put an equal sign. Again, I saw a number of people make that mistake. First things first, taking that minus 6 over to become a plus 6, so that became 36. And then there's nothing at all wrong with leaving your answer as that, 36 over 5. A number of people attempt to then go and solve that and they did it wrong. You get two marks for leaving your answer as that. That is in simplest form. You don't need to do anything else to it. If you really want to, you can. But this line in blue is not needed. The 7, uh, 7.2. X is less than 7.2. Okay, then number 7. Some people just spot these really, really quickly. You might be able to spot the pattern. If I look at the black, I've got 1, then 4, then 9. If you look at the shape here, it's always making a square. So if it's always making a square, what sort of numbers is it? It's the square numbers. If needs be, write out with the numbers there, 1, 4, 9, and hopefully you will spot that pattern. You should be getting used to spotting patterns now. Some people would even go one step further and find the difference in between, say 3, then 5. And then, well, if you try and find the second difference, you can only find it once anyway. They're looking for you to be spotting that as a pattern that is always making squares. So my nth term here would be n squared. Now, for the white ones, it probably is a good idea to go and write down what, how many you've got. So, 1, 2, 3 in the first pattern, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 in the next pattern, and then 7 in the final pattern. So, that is going up in 2s every single time. So, if it's going up in 2s every single time, we can say it's 2n, because that's the 2 times table that goes up in 2s every single time. And then, two ways to do it, you could either write out the 2 times table above this sequence here, which would be 2, 4, 6, and then say, right, what do I do to 2 to get to 3? What do I do to 4 to get to 5? I'm adding 1 every time. However, you can come and find the term in front of the first term here. What would this number here be? Which obviously doesn't really exist, so I'll put it in a box. And that would be 1, but what sort of 1? It would be positive 1. So my sequence would be the 2n, 2 coming from that going up in 2s every time, and the plus 1 being that 1 in front of the 3. Um, okay, there we go. For the next question beneath that, um, it was standard form. Uh, now, this trick only works when you have minus, uh, minus numbers. Don't use it all the time. Uh, when you have to the minus 2, that means it's going to be a really small number, and it is 1, 2, zeros. There's a link between those two, but it only works in negatives, that trick. What's really happening is we're saying how many times does this decimal point have to jump to be in between the 2 and the 1 here? So it jumps once, twice. That's why that, that um, is a 2, really. But that trick only works in minuses. Uh, pretty disappointed with the next one. How many people forgot what a half meant? If you showed me anywhere that the half means a square root of 400, you got a mark. That's what half means. The half is the square root, so a third would be a cube root. Uh, the minus bit here, I've tried to colour coordinate this. The minus means 1 over, so whatever you have would be 1 over and then what it would normally be. So 1 over the square root of 400, which is 1 over 20. For the next question, lots of people didn't like this. They didn't like trying to describe it in algebra, and I think a couple of people didn't just had a guess and just managed to potluck it. Um, what you need to do is try and work on this shape here. You've got a triangle here, and you know stuff about triangles. Angles in a triangle add to 180. Uh, looking here, I can spot an F angle, a corresponding angle. So this angle here and here are the same. The same is true here with the C, so this angle here is also C, so using angles on a straight line add to 180, 
this angle inside here, the blue bit, is 180 minus C. So what I've done now, and you can see here I've described exactly what I've done, I said I've found um, B and C by using corresponding F angles, um, and then use those angles on a straight line. Now by using angles in a triangle, I'm saying that this angle here, plus this angle here, plus this angle here, must equal 180 conditions of, of angles in a triangle. So I've said A plus B plus 180 minus C is equal to 180. I'm now going to take that plus 180 over and it will become minus 180. So 180 minus 180 is gone, there's nothing left. So now I'm going to take C over because it says find the size of angle C. So I want C to be positive, I didn't like the fact that it was negative. So I've got that A plus B is equal to C, so that is doing what it's asked me to there. The bird feed question went down uh, quite quite badly, not a lot of people um, understanding exactly what to do with the first bit and again missing bits in the second bit and sort of not quite understanding the question. So I do want to spend a bit of time talking this one through. This is a ratio question. We're told we've got 2 grams of buckwheat, 3 grams of millet and 5 grams of sunflower seeds. How much millet is there in an 850 uh, gram bag of winter mix bird food? So... What you needed to do was add together the parts, so 2 plus 3 plus 5 is 10. Uh, you then need to divide the total amount by 10 to find out how much one part was. And then we're asked for millet here, which is the three parts. So I need to do one. Uh, I need to do 85 times by 3. So you can see here, because this is a non-calculated paper, I partition my numbers into 80 and 5. Tripled that, tripled that, put them back together to get 255 grams. Uh, the next bit here, it was tricky, it wasn't the easiest question in the world. Six marks here, you're told that this is quality of written communication by here. That means you have to describe what you're doing, it can't just be calculations. If you have got clear maths calculations, that will get you one mark, but you'll definitely not get two. So just try and um, interlace it with sentences or little arrows just explaining what you're doing. Okay, now the first thing to note here is that you're told that she buys exactly five kilograms of the of the summer bird food. Okay, that can't be. You can't say, which I saw a number of people say, right, three uh, three hundred grams times that by seventeen. That's five thousand one hundred. That's near enough. It's it's not the case. We're told it's exactly five kilograms. So we have to try and find the cheapest option. So you have to try and think of different ways to make five kilograms and again I've just it's just come to mind what a couple of people did was they they tried to find out what the price for every 250 grams was um, or something to that effect which isn't the worst uh, thing in the world to do but that's not what you're asked to do in this case if it is saying what is the best value one then that's actually quite a good idea to say right let's find a number that each of these go into so say 50 grams let's find out how much 50 grams of this would cost 50 grams of this would cost and 50 grams but that wasn't what it was asking he didn't say what's the best value it said what's the cheapest option to buy exactly five kilograms so what I did over here I wrote down the um, the numbers so I could see them here and I just explained here that I've got all of my prices in the same units that's going to be key and again grams and kilograms let's work everything in grams or kilograms it didn't make any sense to me to work in 0 0.25 grams or 0 0.3 grams I thought that was be, uh, going to be confusing and then again here, I just worked everything in pence just to make things now nice and easy. So I've now said, now I'll work, um, I will make 5,000 grams or 5 kilograms in different ways. So option one, well I spotted the 4 kilogram bag or the 4,000 grams, so I thought that's pretty close. And I've found that 4 lots of the 250 uh, grams would make a total of 5,000 grams. So now I need to work out how much that would be. So this bit was easy, I was already told what the price of that is, and this bit here, four lots of the 250 bags, then I needed to do four lots of that. Um, times in my four, we've got the tricks of double it, double it again. So double of 49 is 98, and then double of 98 is 196. I'm quite happy for you to not show that you've done that, I, I get that, I find that a reasonably straightforward calculation, so I wouldn't worry too much about overkilling your answer, saying, look, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. You'll find that I've t taken up a lot of the space anyway without going um, to absolute death with it. Um, so, 760 plus 196 came to a total of 956p, or in probably better maths, £9.56. Option two, well... I worked out in the last bit here that that made a thousand grams, 
So if that makes a thousand grams, then multiply that by five must make five thousand grams or five kilograms. So that's exactly what I did to my last uh, last bit of maths. I already worked out that as one ninety six. So I just times that price by five, and it made nine eighty or nine pound eighty. My third option. I thought I haven't used the three hundred gram bags yet. I must be able to use that. Uh, originally, I thought right, how many is the maximum three hundred bags I could get in, which would be four thousand eight hundred. But then I've got no denominations that fit in exactly to five thousand. So I worked backwards and used fifteen uh fifteen bags here. Uh so fifteen bags of that came to four thousand five hundred grams, and two bags then came to five hundred grams, totaling that together gave me the five thousand grams. So then I needed to do fifty-four pence times by fifteen. So again you can see I partitioned the fifteen into ten and five. Uh, times that by 10 was quite easy and then times by 5 was quite easy because it's half of this answer here. I needed four, 49p times by 2 of the 250 bags which came to 98p which came to a total of £9.08 and, and for me that was as far as I could go. I couldn't think of any other cheaper ways of making it and then I've just concluded here what I did. Okay, the next question here, this was uh, a simultaneous equations question, and it sort of set that up for you as well. It told you that you've got two bottles of black currant cordial, three bottles of soda water, and you're told here how much it costs, and then four bottles of black currant and one bottle of soda water is that much. Simultaneous equations are four marks. It's, this is five marks because you had to set up the equations. So believe it or not, you get just one mark for writing the red and the blue line here. Okay, next you had to get the coefficients the same. Uh, some ways I saw were probably simpler than my way here. I've times by 1 and times by 3. The reason why I've done that is I've decided to get the s's the same. To get the s's the same, whatever this uh, number in front of the s, I have to multiply it by here and then vice versa here. So that 3 comes down here. What that does is it will get the s bits exactly the same. I could have times this by 4 and this by 2 or I could have times just the top one by 2 because 2 times 2 b times 2 would give me 4 b and it would cancel the b's out okay so a number of different ways to get it there the way I did it was I did uh, what I said here times by 1 and times by 3 so this one here stayed exactly the same for number 3 it didn't change what uh, whatsoever and this one here make sure you triple absolutely everything so we get 12 b plus 3 s and then 248 times 3 uh, if I was to do it in my head, 250 times 3, 250, 5 quid, 750, and then 2p less um, times that by 3 would be 6p less, so that's why it's 744, but as you can see here, I just did a check just to make sure I hadn't done it wrong. Um, 4 take away 3 works better than 3 take away 4 because 2b take away 12b will give me minus 10b. Don't want any negatives there, so I've, uh, I've reversed the order. So I have then done... Um, 4 take away 3 which gave me 10b the s is cancelled, no more s's and then 744 take away 204 comes to 540 um, so that is uh, 0.54 when it's divided by 10 or 54p, I thought it looked a bit nicer in pence here so I wrote it in pence and then I've substituted that b was 54p into 1 I chose 1 because these numbers were smaller so I thought it would be easier, although looking at this now this um, this one here I would have only had to have 54p in it so maybe it would have been easier but it doesn't matter which one you do it in so I've got two 54s uh, plus three s's is uh, 204 so then two times 54 is 108 and then subtracting that from the uh, from the 204 gives me 96p oh I've just spotted a small mistake here so I was a little bit too eager to write in my answer here. That should technically still be 204. Uh, and then we should have. I should have made the sen sentence 3s is equal to 0 0.96, working in pence. Um, but I have got the correct final answer here of 32p. Okay then, for this question here, the way that we do it in Mr. Ashton's class is that we look at the denominators here and find the lowest common uh, multiple of the denominators to get rid of it. We don't like denominators. Other teachers might tell you to get the same denominator the whole way throughout. That's not the way I like to do it. I like to say we don't like these denominators. Get rid of them. So what I've done is I've found the smallest number that 2, 3 and 6 go into. The way to start is that for the biggest number on the bottom, that's 6, 
It can't be anything smaller than 6, so it might be 6, but it's usually a little bit bigger. It's usually in the 6 times table. But as you can see, 3 and 2 both go into 6, so 6 is the lowest common multiple. That doesn't mean that you can't times 3 by 12 or by 24 or by 18 or whatever. You can because there's still multiples. It will just have slightly bigger numbers and will make it slightly harder work to work throughout the question. So where that 6 is, when I multiply through by 6 on every step, I then get my mark, okay? But what I must do now, so every step is times by 6, um, which makes it still equal as long as you do the same thing to everything. I've counted how many 2s go into 6, so that is 3. How many 3s go into 6, that's 2. How many 6s go into 6, that's 1. Next, I'm going to expand out the brackets, so I've tried to keep those colour-coded. So this 3 here in red gave me the 18, then the 3 times x was positive 3x. So lots of people getting that absolutely fine. This is a plus 2 times by 2, so that gave me positive 2. A plus 2 times by 3x gave me minus 6x. And again, lots of people doing that fine. And this one here is just 1 times 31. That's 31. The main issue with this question was people were messing up what's in the yellow here. You have got 3x and you are taking away 6x. That means you're going to have less... Um, less x's because you had 3 and you're now taking away 6 that is minus 3x way too many people said 3x be careful so you should have had 18 plus 4 is 22 minus 3x or you could have had minus 3x plus 22 doesn't matter which way around is equal to 31 now taking the 22 over you should get 9 and again I saw some funny answers there be careful 31 take away 22 is 9 worst case scenario write down by the side using the old school methods 1 take away 2 can't do it borrow 1 11 take away 2 is 9 0 okay trust me it is definitely 9 um, minus 3x is equal to 9 take the minus 3 times x so we're taking the minus 3 times in x over to the other side so it goes over as a divide by minus 3 Okay, so 9 divided by minus 3. Now, lots of people actually just left their answer as that. And as far as I'm concerned, that's good enough because that is, um, that is correct. You can cancel it down. It does cancel down very nicely to minus 3. Okay, and the, um, the composite shape question here. So we had to work out what shapes we had here. So we're told a semicircle is joined to a square. So if that's 8 centimetres, then that's 8 centimetres as well. And then just so I can get my parts for a circle, because if I'm going to be working in an area, because it says calculate the total area, then I need to know what its radius is. At the moment, I know the diameter of that. Now, the beauty of this was it said leave your answer in terms of pi. So there's very little working out to do here, uh, and people were just making harder work than they needed to. So the first thing that I did was I said this area is made up of a square and a semicircle. The formula for a semicircle is pi r squared divided by 2. Lots of people forgetting that divided by 2 bit. It's divided by 2 because it's a semicircle. It's a circle cut in half. So it's pi r squared for a circle, pi r squared over 2 for a semicircle. Um, to get the square, it was just 8 times 8. So it was 64. To get the semicircle, it would have been pi times by the radius squared. So that's 4 squared, not 8 squared, and then divided by 2. 4 squared is 16. 16 divided by 2 is 8, and then 8 times by pi is 8 pi, because it said leave your answer in terms of pi, so you didn't even need to work that bit out. Lots of people going and actually putting in that pi was equal to 3.14, multiplying that out, add them together correctly, but not getting the full 2 marks, because for the 2 marks it said you must leave your answer in terms of pi, so it actually made it even easier for you than you thought. For the bit below, anything to the power of 0 is 1. You must have heard that about a million times now from me. Anything. So that is 100 to the power of 0 is equal to 1. X to the power of 0 is equal to 1. ABC to the power of 0 is equal to 1. Anything to the power of 0 is 1. Okay, You've got to remember that. That's very, 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 very important. Because when it comes up, it's one of the easiest marks on the test. Um, the next one, standard form... Remember, the tens deal with the tens, the numbers deal with the numbers. If it is coming up in a non calculator paper, it will be reasonably straightforward. 4.5 divided by 9. You should spot that 4.5 is half of 9. So that is 0 0.5 there to deal with the numbers. When you are dividing powers, you subtract the powers. So that is 8 minus 12. 8 minus 12 is minus 4. Okay? The issue with this, leaving this as your answer, you'll get one mark for writing that. You will not get the two marks because the issue with this is that it is not in standard form. To get in standard form, you must be in the form 
a times 10 to a power where a is an a unit okay so one um, is fine but it's got to be smaller than 10 so 9.99999 again would be fine it must be a unit and that is not a unit so to make that a unit I've times by 10 but if I times something by 10 to keep it equal I've got to divide by 10 as well so I'm dividing by 10 again here so effectively I'm doing 10 to the power of minus 4 divided by 10 to the power of 1 so that becomes 10 to the minus 5 okay so that's how I got that minus 5 there final question Way too many people read that it was a histogram and just drew a bog standard easy bar chart slash group frequency diagram that you could do when you were like in year four. Last question of a GCSE will not be that simple. If you think it's that simple, you've missed something. Go back and read the question. A number of people still highlighted it was a histogram, wrote down this formula here, which you've been told to write down, and still missed what to do with it. Okay, You've got to be careful here. It said draw a histogram. If you drew a bar chart, absolutely no marks straight away. That's not a histogram. A histogram is a bar chart, but it is uh, different to a bar chart because it is plotted against frequency density, not frequency, and the bars are of unequal width. Okay then, so I wrote out my formula here. Frequency density is equal to frequency divided by class width. I then worked out what the class widths of each of these were. So between 0 and 20 is a class width of 20. 20 to 40 is a class width of 20, and so on, and so on. Apart from the last one, which is a class width of 40, because it goes from 80 to 120. To work out the frequency density, I then need to do 36 divided by 20. So the way I did that was I divided by 2 and then by 10, because dividing by 2 then dividing by 10 is the same as dividing by 20. I broke it up into numbers of times to make 20. Um, I did the same here, I did the same here, well in fact actually 20, how many 20 is going to 100 is slightly easier, um, and then this one here I divided by 4 first, um, in fact I've just spotted, um, no I haven't scrapped that, um, I, I said how many 4s go into 8 which is 2, and then 2 divided by 10 is 0 0.2. Okay, So if your axes did not have frequency density there, you can expect 0 marks. Um, so because the highest frequency density was 5, I didn't actually use the last two points here. Uh, I only went up to 5. I chose a nice scale for myself. And then all I had to do was uh, fill in the data that I'd already worked out. Um, just because you didn't get those marks, however, it didn't mean that you couldn't get these marks here. Uh, slightly tricky and you had to think about it. It says 220-year-olds uh, were set the same task. So if I go back and read what this says, it says the time taken to answer a short questionnaire was measured for each person in a group of 210-year-olds. So the difference this time is that it's 220-year-olds. So you'd assume that 220-year-olds would be quicker um, because they're that bit older, but that's not necessarily the case. It says the times taken to assume the short questionnaire were recorded using the same time intervals as were used for the 10-year-olds. The median time for the 20 year olds uh, to answer the short questionnaire was 58 seconds. Gemma says the median for the 10 year olds is the same as the median for the 20 year olds. Fred disagrees. He says the median for the 10 year olds could be less than the median for the 20 year olds. Explain why either Gemma or Fred could be correct. So the first point I've made here said the median time for the 10 year olds is the 100th person, which is in the 40 to the um, 60th category. Okay, the way I worked that out was I came back to here, I did 200 divided by 2 because the median is the middle, so I'm looking for the 100th person. And again, this is going in order, isn't it? 0 up to 120. So the 36th person was in here, the 36 plus 44 is 80, so the 80th person was in here, so the, um, the 100th person was in this category. Okay, he was in this category here, the 40 to 61. So coming back over to here, um, if we look at what their one was, look, the median for them was 58 seconds. That's in the same category. So Gemma making this statement here, the median time for the 10-year-olds is the same as the median time for the 20-year-olds, is absolutely fine. Okay, so that's exactly what I said there. I said, therefore, Gemma could be right. In fact, I've just spotted a literacy mistake there. So that should be right like that, shouldn't it? Um because 58 seconds is in the same category, hence she's correct. But if we use a little bit more um, analysis here, we've got 100 people here. 
So you'd expect that to be split up evenly, those those 100 people to be split up between equally between the 40th and 60th. It may not be the case. It may be that they were really close to a minute, but it may not be. It may be that they were really close to 40. So what I would expect, if that was 100, if this uh, ran the distance of 100, I expect the 20th person to be here rather than right at the end. Okay? So I expect them to be vastly quicker than the middle. So if the, the 50th person, I expect to be at 50. Okay, because 50 is half of 100, so I expect them to be bang in the middle of 40 to 60. Uh, so what I did here was I rearranged my formula that FD equals uh, frequency over class width. I swapped over the FD and the CW, which we've looked at before that we know we can do, to work out what the class width is. So the class width is the frequency, so that would be 20 people in to the 100th person category, divided by the frequency density. So if I come off here to that bar, the frequency density was 5. So basically, I'm trying to say, I know that there are 100 people in this bar. I want to split it so that I have 20 on one side and 80 on the other. Okay? So the way that I did that was I did my frequency 20 divided by 5, which tells me it's a class width of 4, so I'd expect that uh, I'd expect the median in the ten-year-old's time to be the forty-fourth person because I've just found that class width being four. Okay, so a reasonably tricky bit of maths there. That's why it's the last question on the paper.